Welcome to WO's core webinar with a focus on endoscope reprocessing, high-level disinfection versus sterilization. Without further ado, I'm handing over to Chair Dr. Raul Panala. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, World Endoscopy Organization core program webinar. It's really a pleasure to have you. Uh, we put together a series of webinars uh, focused on endoscope reprocessing, and this is the second in the series of webinars. We have a uh, fabulous international panel of speakers and panelists today, and I hope that you will find this uh, very sort of informative. I'll turn it over uh, to Dr. Mostana, who will be the, uh, running the webinar today. Just a couple of housekeeping points. One is as the uh, please use the uh, question and answer um, uh, function in the Zoom for any questions and answers. We'll have a panel discussion at the end. Uh, the chat function has been turned off. Uh, please be, um, please bring your questions and we look forward to a very fabulous uh, webinar. I'll hand over to Dr. Most to now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panala. I'm uh, uh, very glad to be part of this exciting session regarding uh, endoscope reprocessing and infection control. I would like first to thank uh, our speakers from the, uh, as a part of um, this session. But our speakers today are Professor Kumar from India, Professor Coronel from the United States, and Professor Fege from the United States. And also we have our, um, our panelists today, which are Professor Singh, which is a manager of quality and uh, performance improvement department in, uh, from Abu Dhabi, United Arab um, Emirates. And also as a panelist uh, will join us today, Professor Imran from Rehman Medical Institute Peshawar, Pakistan, and Professor Chadari, he uh, is a hospital and super specialty gastroenterology center uh, specialist from Jalgaon, India. Our first speaker today is uh, Professor Ajay Kumar. He is a chairman and head of department in BLK Max Institute for Digestive and Liver Disease, India. And also it's a BC Roy Awardee from President of India and the International Service Award from American Society of GI Endoscopy. He is a past president of Indian Society of Gastroenterology and Society of GI Endoscopy of India, and also a past member of Publication Committee of All Endoscopy Organization, All Society of Digestive Endoscopy, working on quality in endoscopy and practice guidelines and publication in endoscopy. Professor Kumar, over to you. Thank you, Professor Mastian. Uh, let me just activate my screen sharing. Can you see my screen there? Yes, perfectly, thank you. Okay, let's uh, one second. Well, uh, thou said, let me first uh, take this opportunity to thank WEO to bring out such an important topic and highlight and to generate a debate on the issue of high level disinfection, whether it's safe and effective or not, or you have an alternative of sterilization, which is a key burning issue. And thanks uh, Dr. Rahul and Dr. Masyanam uh, for a kind introduction. Well, uh, see if you look at it, what is the current existing state? The endoscopes are put on high level disinfection because they are semi-critical devices. And that is the, re and also because they are heat labile, so obviously difficult to sterilize, of course, with the newer modifications, one can do that. But this has been going on. Why is this debate known? And the answer to that is a number of issues. And that scopes as a semi-critical devices is under attack. These are the various issues that I will like to handle and will take one by one. And the most important thing, why this debate? If you look at this uh, 
summary of the various infections to the various endoscopes. The ERCP induced pseudomonas in 152 patients in 23 outbreaks, causing infection in almost 89 patients, has led on to this uproar. And then this particular US Senate report which reported more than 25 outbreaks of multi drug resistant organisms and created a uproar all over because it has been reported with almost all the scopes which were available to us by the different manufacturers. And the second reason why this became such an important, because if you look at the earlier reports of the endoscope, um, endoscopes transmitting infection from patient to patient, they were all attributed to some breach in the disinfection protocol. But these CRE infections through the duodenoscope, there's no such failure in reprocessing was identified. And more equally worrisome was that they were traceable to the source. So the issue is understandable that the doubts have been created on the current practices of disinfection in the endoscope as we follow. But if we look at the entire disinfection cycle, the HLD is only one of the components. See, these are the various eight steps that we look at. All of us are familiar with that. The three, the most important ones which I have highlighted in red ink is the manual cleaning, high level disinfection and drying. Each and every step is important, but these three become the most important. That's the first thing. So I'll come to the endoscope related issues there. The second part that when we are looking at an endoscope's disinfection, there are three, uh, I mean, uh, three barriers that we come to our mind. One is that these have a high microbial load. Two, the endoscope design is complex. And third is the issue of biofilm. The last two I'll touch in the last briefly, but let's look at this that even with the current practice of HLD, it le leads on to the reduction of the microbial load by I mean, uh, by significant number, but still after processing, the level of contamination is about four logs. So the principle is of maximal contamination and minimal cleaning concept. And then it actually gives you a very minimal margin of safety or a non-existent margin of safety. And that's why the even a little bit breach in that causes a major problems. And that's the whole uh, philosophy that the, this is a, a creating a problem. Now let's examine the issue in details. What are the pitfalls and how to overcome them with HLD? In an excellent study published 2019, data from 900 scopes across USA in which they looked at all the factors which could they trace to the uh, responsible, being responsible for the transmission of infection. I mentioned here, I will take them one by one. But if more imp uh, one important thing to understand that none of these, all these factors which have been identified, none of these is pointing at HLD in specific, but most of those are human factors. These are more to do with manual cleaning, the use of the right water, or practice of drying the scopes. So let's look at the structural damage. If you look at the various series and all these scopes which were pinpointed that they were responsible for transmission of infection, some of the other structural problem was identified. And because of this, the society has already taken action. The manufacturers have already taken action and all three major endoscope manufacturers now require annual inspection and maintenance of duodenoscopes. They've been asked to make bore scopes, which will lead on to direct visualization of the endoscope working channel, 
using a slender small caliber camera and which will identify the residues of the moisture droplets. And that will actually help in standardizing the quality of the sterilization. And of course, culture and quarantine approach uh, has to be used. The semeticone, lubricants, and tissue glue are the products and that have been interfering with the reprocessing. And now this is discouraged. Use of these things, semeticone and lubricants is discouraged. And if you look at the presence of residual soil after manual cleaning or the water quality issues, so you have to have a quality manual cleaning with clean water. What we need to impose to need the quality parameters for assessing manual cleaning and put into action. And none of these, you see, whatever I'm pointing out, none of these factors are related with high level disinfection. And retained moisture, actually this is what is required, is a dryer and we need the nice light uh, closets to st store them and to dry them. And these things have to be implemented across the world. So with the, if we actually follow all this, then uh, we, uh, we can minimize these problems to a great extent. And whatever method we use, whether it is HLD or sterilization, these factors that I have mentioned just now are common to both. So this is something which if you replace one with the other, you cannot change that. And then even if you look at HLD, the major Problems that are taking place are the human factors which contribute to the non-adherence with all these things. And if we do not stick to the in, uh, instructions for the use given by the manufacturer, or if these IFUs are not being uh, transmitted properly to the user. If you look at these, in the same article that I quoted in the American Journal of Infectious Control, they have identified that IFU is the biggest culprit, is a highly variable for different HLD agents. It's confusing. You, can, you have to follow a single agent and IFU for that because there are variations with the different agents with the effective concentrations for the duration for which it can be used, maximum time of reuse, and when you use the strip to test, what is the testing time for that? All these things have to be standardized have to be implemented. So, and, and then the shipping and storage conditions of agent. And then this study, they've actually gone to details why this non-adherence occurs to the guidelines. And that's another area that we need to look at, that then there's a workflow, there's a time pressure. You fix more number of procedures than your space allows or the time gap allows. So the endoscopic suites have to be planned in a way that you are able to have number of, uh, depending upon the number of you know, the workload that you can have in a day. So how many number of endoscopy suites you require, how many scopes you require so that you have enough turnover time uh, before taking the scope into use. And then there are genuine occupational health concerns of the endoscopy staff going into disinfection and trying to cut corners because they feel that there's these fumes from this can harm them. And as I said earlier, IFUs have been very complex. They need to be simplified and uniform. People have looked at that if you don't use HLD, then what are the modifications? Automatic endoscopic reprocessors, large number of people have shifted onto that, but then there can be problems with that. People have talked about repeat HLD that still does not provide the answer or you will look at the high level disinfectant, none of them provides an adequate uh, answers. In the AR maintenance, one has to look at the quality controls there, at the temperature, filters, fluid flow rates, channel blockages and leak test failures. Because once that happens, the, even the automatic endoscopic reprocessors will create problems if they are not adhered to. And uh, chemicals have to be provided, the uh, inventory has to be right. So if I have to sum up all the problems that we have faced, what is required? And this is the most important slide from my point of view for a high level disinfection to be effective. What you need 
is the training and retraining. At our center, we have a schedule that every uh, six months, we have a retraining schedule for our endoscopic staff. And once in a year, when the new resident staffs join, then we have another retraining for uh, all of them. I think this not only helps in retraining, it also helps in stressing upon them the need and importance of the disinfection procedures. And once we do that, then we need an independent hospital infection control cell, which in a lot of developing countries do not exist. And they have to do the surveillance and monitoring. And this should, should not be just a formality that has to be, the regular list has to be made, how many cultures to be checked from where and whether these practices are being followed or not. And as I said earlier, match the number of endoscopes, endoscopists and the procedures. There has been a study done in India where they have calculated that for a X number of endoscopic, uh, endoscopists and X number of endoscopic suites and X number of patients, this is the minimal requirement. And that should be imposed on the hospitals to buy that sort of a, a equipment so as to make it practicable. It is that so that these protocols are not only on paper, they're actually put into practice. And for course, frequent MEC testing and to follow IFU religiously. So we keep on blaming HLD and asking for replacement, as my worthy colleague will talk about that, I will say it as a corollary. It is like blaming the traffic lights when you don't follow the traffic lights and meet with an accident. So if everybody starts following the traffic lights, obviously the things will uh, follow. So that one has to look in the right perspective. As I said in the beginning that microbial load is not the only factor. The other factors which are inherent in the design is the complexity of the endoscope design and the biofilm. We all know that the endoscopes are long, narrow lumens, right angle bends, springs and valves. And so the damaged channels may impede microbial exposure to high level disinfection. So the manufacturers have to take care and make some come innovations and whatever method that you use, whether it is HLD or sterilization, these improvements have to take place. And we all know about the biofilm. Without going to the details, let's uh, look, uh, these are just scary looking um, uh, biofilm, but this is a reality people have identified and people have tried to come out with innovations. And one thing is initially, which was the society came out that you modified manual cleaning and uh, the, with a special um, uh, brushes, and uh, or modify the design. I'll talk about modified design uh, later, but modified manual cleaning is by a specially manufacturer recommended brush. And these are, I've taken from one of the manufacturers, the various um, uh, techniques to clean that. I'm not going to the details of that. So in our training uh, of the uh, staff, we make sure that these people are following that. When it comes to the modified design, it is a study published in 2018 from the US and it showed that people as users, you know, you may do anything, but then look at the users. Users wanted a scope redesign. Majority of them, some of them asked for disposable equipment, some uh, better manual cleaning method and so on. And what is FDA done? They said that uh, FDA believes that the best solution to reducing the risk of disease transmission for duodenoscores is through innovative design, making reprocessing easier, more effective or unnecessary. In response to that, some manufacturers have come up with a, uh, uh, removable caps, which may uh, not cost too much. It may be uh, acceptable. And there is a, uh, that, uh, it can, is a disposable cap, which you can take care of the vulnerable part of the scope for the biofilm formation. And there is a endoscopic sleeve, came with Pankaj Pasricha. That's another one on the pipeline and which will cover that and it's a disposable thing. It can be used uh, after every different uh, disposal with every procedure. Of course, disposable endoscopes are there, but then they have their own problems. There are two models that are already available and good studies are available. But the key questions remains that can be afforded. And what about the medical waste that they will produce? There's a famous saying that while the medical disposal of industry may benefit from labeling devices as single use only, we all bear the cost of subsequent disposal and pollution. 
So friends, I conclude my presentation that just because we are facing problem, I, I mean, we understand endoscopes transmitting infections is a serious problem and there should be zero tolerance for that. But then we need to uh, simplify the endoscopic designs. High level disinfection is the cornerstone of the disinfection cycle. But the more important is to follow the protocols rather than change over to new methods uh, because human factors are common to both and it will remain uh, whatever we may do. Thank you very much. And I'll be looking forward to the next one. Thank you very much. I hope I stuck to my time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor um, Kumar. Uh, for a very interesting talk. And I think it was very nicely underlined uh, the importance of human factor as a major confounding factor for uh, reprocessing error. Thank you. Our next uh, talk uh, will focus on endoscope sterilization as a necessary step to minimize risk. And the presenter is uh, Dr. Emmanuel Coronel. He is a gastroenterologist and advanced therapeutic endoscopist at MD Anderson Center. After completing medical school, Dr. Coronel uh, was a postdoctoral fellow at Beth Israel Diaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School. His research was focused on pancreatic diseases and the development of clinical research teaching programs across Latin America. And also he is the founder and co-director of the International Research Initiative, which is a comprehensive educational program which is designed for individuals who want to pursue rigorous clinical or basic science research careers. Dr. Coronel also completed his residency training in internal medicine at the University of Miami, Jackson Memorial Hospital, and his gastroenterology fellowship at the University of Chicago, where he served as a chief fellow from 2015 and 2016. Dr. Colonel pursued an advanced therapeutic endoscopy fellowship at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Institute, where he now serves as faculty and is the associate center medical director of endoscopy. He has multiple peer review publication awards and serves as a reviewer for multiple medical journals, including gastrointestinal endoscopy and video gastrointestinal endoscopy. Dr. Colonel, we are waiting for your talk. You're on mute, Dr. Coronel. Oh, there we go. So uh, Ophelia, thank you so much for that very kind presentation and uh, for Dr. Kumar for that fantastic talk on HLD. So we're gonna be talking today a little bit about uh, endoscope sterilization. Is it a necessary step to decrease risk? These are my disclosures. So today we're gonna to be talking a little bit about the background and clinical importance of uh, endoscope sterilization and duodenoscope infections. We're going to discuss about sterilization methods, advantages and disadvantages, and sterilization strategies for your endoscopy unit. Duodenoscope infections are incredibly important. These are relatively rare, but they pose a serious public health risk. In the United States, there are about 660,000 ERCP procedures performed every year. And these infections, infections can happen because of cross-contamination between an infected patient to the duodenoscope and then to a, to a healthy patient. The more worrisome ones are the ones that happen with CRE or carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae. That can be Klebsiella, E. coli, E. coli, or Pseudomonas. And in a study from 1,177 patients that were followed prospectively after ERCP for 30 days, close to 5% of the ordinoscopes still had positive cultures despite intensive disinfection protocols. In the past, we thought this was incredibly low risk. And I think this happened because we counted all of the infections that were related to endoscopy and the ERCP related infections became diluted. There's also a lag between the appearance of symptoms and the ERCP. Patients would present with remote infection sites were not thought to be ERCP related. And there was a lack of cultures post ERCP. Now we know the risk is much higher. In this review from uh, different outbreaks around the world, we see that in a best case scenario, 6% of patients can become infected if they are exposed to an infected duodenoscope. So what is the culprit of these infections? And 
it's not like the elevator is the only culprit, but this is one of the or the or the worst offenders, as to say. The elevator is a notorious part of the Duodeno scope that is very difficult to clean. It can form biofilm, just like Dr. Kumar mentioned and showed beautiful pictures on this. And here that dangerous bacteria can harbor and proliferate. And this area can be very difficult to, to, to reach. So as for our devices, the Spalding classification is a classification that helps us determine the degree of disinfection or sterilization that is required for medical devices. We have non-critical devices. Those are devices that touch the skin. These devices require low, low level disinfection. Semi-critical devices that touch the mucous membranes. These are all of our GI endoscopes. These devices require high level disinfection. And critical devices. These devices are devices that touch sterile tissue, body fluids, or are in the intravascular system. And these devices should undergo sterilization. So if we know that duodenoscopes and linear EOSoscopes that also have an elevator are very, very difficult to clean, does this make them critical devices that need sterilization? So that's the question we're trying to answer. This has created a lot of buzz in the media and also um, a serious uh, public health risk and also distrust in the public on, the, on ERCP. So uh, the FDA actually recommended enhancement to standard duodenoscopes as a reasonable next step. They do not, uh, these enhancement steps, enhancement in the reprocessing doesn't replace uh, regular IFUs and standard reprocessing guidelines. They also recommend microbiologic culturing, repeat high level disinfection and scope sterilization. So to do scope sterilization, these are the necessary steps and Dr. Kumar already touched on this, but we have the procedure, the scope has to undergo pre-cleaning, then after that a leak test, the scope has to undergo manual cleaning and HLD, and then is sent off to sterilization. Scope sterilization techniques are aimed to eliminate all viable microorganisms, decreasing the risk for scope contamination and potential infection transmission. These are not needed for most endoscopes, like upper scopes and colonoscopes, a single HLD is sufficient, but this may be an interesting solution for dodinoscopes and linear echoendoscopes. Um, sterilization can be performed with ethylene oxide sterilization, liquid chemical sterilization, and there's new methods such as hydrogen peroxide ozone that are under investigation. So as for ethylene oxide, after HLD, the scope has to be placed in a sealed chamber where humidity and airflow and temperature are controlled, there is a vacuum that is created in this chamber and the ETO gas is released and this gas gets into every crevice of the scope and the scope becomes sterilized. As for liquid chemical sterilization, this is designed for heat sensitive critical and semi-critical devices. The scope is soaked in parasitic acid. The scope must be washed and purified after and then dried and stored. So Dr. Fagel is going to be talking a little bit more about this, but what are the advantages and disadvantages? So scope ETO sterilization can be highly effective in eliminating microbial burden and is good for heat sensitive devices, but this is a carcinogenic gas, it's flammable, and you need special personnel to handle this gas. There's a long turnaround time, which can take about 24 to 48 hours, and it can cause a scope damage. As for liquid chemical sterilization, it may be faster than ETO, also good for heat sensitive devices, but you have to have a careful calculation of the concentration exposure time and temperature of uh, the parasitic acid. And the scope is really not sterile at the end since you have to uh, wash it with purified water and then dry it and store it. So whenever you're doing uh, those extra steps that become the scope um, essentially doesn't become sterile anymore. So should it become a standard? In non-outbreak settings, there is very limited data. There is one randomized controlled trial comparing single HLD, double HLD, and HLD with ETO. After three months, the study was closed for futility as there weren't sufficient events observed to evaluate the primary outcome, which was culture positive for MDRO. The, bacter the bacterial growth was actually very, very similar between all groups, the single HLD, double HLD, and the HLD ETO group. So we couldn't really make a, a conclusion on this. And there is a prospective randomized controlled trial comparing double HLD with liquid, liquid chemical sterilization. There, this was a study that lasted one year, 67 scopes were randomized, 878 cultures obtained, and in total 17 out of these 878 cultures were positive for any organisms, and there was no difference 
in the rate of culture pauses between double HLD and liquid chemical sterilization. But during infectious outbreaks, ETO has been shown to terminate these outbreaks. In a systematic review from 17 centers with outbreaks, six centers implemented ETO, and there was an absence of culture positivity at all centers. We have to mention that other measures were adopted to prevent additional infections. This included removing the implicated duodenos from use, retraining staff about proper cleaning, microbial culturing of the duodenoscope, and returning the duodenoscope to the manufacturer for evaluation, maintenance, or repair. As for my final thoughts, I think that if your endoscopy unit has not had an outbreak, the cost of ETO may not be justified, and it has not yet been proven to be better than double HLD or single HLD. If your endoscopy unit has had a previous CRE outbreak, ETO sterilization should be considered. This should be planned very carefully. I suggest reviewing all of these infection protocols first, creating a task force within your institution, implementing a strong microbial surveillance program so compromised scopes can be identified. And if ETO, ETO sterilization is a consideration, you have to take into account that there is a turnaround time of 24 to 48 hours. There is a cost. Additionally, you may need additional inventory of scopes, and there is a risk of this method. And remember that you can also sterilize the scopes that have been, have been used in high-risk patients. No, you don't have to sterilize every single scope. So you could also implement a partial sterilization strategy as well. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Coronel, for your interesting talk and nicely bringing into focus the trials which challenge the standard disinfection method. I, before the next uh, talk, I would like to urge our attendees to put uh, post questions in the Q&A uh, box. We'll try to address as many as of uh, them in the final uh, part of our session, the panel discussion. Now, uh, the next uh, talk, it will be an interesting and challenging talk regarding pros and cons of uh, high-level disinfection versus sterilization. And it will be presented by Professor Douglas Fager. Professor Douglas Fager is uh, the chairman of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology and Professor of Medicine uh, at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. He is the current uh, se uh, Secretary General and Chair of Education Committee for the World Endoscopy Organization. Also, he served as the president of the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, ACG, between 2015 and 2016. And uh, he received his undergraduate degrees from Harvard College and his MD from the University of Pennsylvania. He is trained in the internal medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and in gastroenterology and therapeutic endoscopy at the University of Pennsylvania. He served on the faculty of Oregon Health and Sciences University for 14 years before joining the Mayo Clinic in 2010. Dr. Fagel specializes in therapeutic endoscopy, pancreatic diseases, and GI oncology. Dr. Fagel, over to you. Well, thank you so much, um, Ophelia, and to Rahul for putting together this really um, great program today. It's really an honor to be here with my uh, fellow uh, speakers and moderators. And um, well, we'll get to it then. So we've heard two great talks on HLD um, and sterilization. So how are you going to choose one over the other? And under what circumstances um, are you going to uh, maybe select one or maybe switch completely to the other? I have no disclosures, just our goals. We're gonna compare HLD and sterilization. We will use the Spalding classification again, go over some definitions, talk about some techniques. Uh, we need to understand the risk of infectious transmission. Also, it's different with forward viewing scopes and, and side viewing scopes, such as duodenoscopes seem to be a special um, category. And then I'll give you some recommendations. So if we go back to that Spalding classification, our devices are, um, classified as non-critical, semi-critical, and critical. And non-critical devices just you know, touch intact skin. They include our bite blocks, but they also include like blood pressure cuffs. And they don't require significant disinfection, low-level disinfection. Uh, things that touch uh, the mucous membranes or non-intact skin are semi-critical. 
and they require at least high-level disinfection, and, and our current endoscopes fall in that group. Critical um, uh, enter sterile areas of the body or go into the vascular system, and they require sterilization. So critical devices, um, examples in daily usage would be laparoscopic equipment, our ERCP catheters, EUS needles, biopsy forceps, our injection needles, and our snares are all critical and they require sterilization. The semi-critical devices that contact mucous membranes are things like endoscopes and NG tubes. Now it's important to note that sterilization is actually recommended for semi-critical device and high level disinfection is acceptable if sterilization is not feasible. So in sterilization, what we're trying to achieve is that all forms of viable organisms are removed or destroyed. And as I said, this is required for critical devices used in sterile areas of the body. HLD uh, involves elimination of all bacteria, viruses, mycobacteria, and fungal spores, and elimination of some but not all bacterial spores and prions. And while these have been acceptable for semi-critical devices, such as our endoscopes, sterilization has been remickened if feasible. Okay, so here's the problem. Um, sterilization has been expensive. It's uh, time consuming. It's not generally available. Um, may damage instruments. It may use toxic and flammable chemicals such as ethylene oxide. And is really overkill for most clinical settings. HLD, on the other hand, is inexpensive. It has very fast turnaround times. It's readily available. We have this in all of our units. It's safe for the instruments. Maybe it's safer for staff if you're, if you're comparing it to ethylene oxide. Uh, but the adequacy has been questioned. Now, it's important to note that whether you're doing high, um, high level disinfection or sterilization, that the high quality manual cleaning steps are still important and sterilization will also fail if that's not done properly. So is HLD adequate? Well, for standard four viewing endos endoscopes, the rea reality is, is that transmission of infection is rare. Although bacteria, chronic viral infections, including hepatitis and HIV and fungus have all been described. Um, when it occurs, it seems to always be associated with a reprocessing failure, such as inadequate manual cleaning steps or there's endoscope damage, or the incorrect cleaning equipment was used, especially the wrong tubing or connectors or channels. So I think for, high, for standard scopes, the HLD is adequate, provided that high quality reprocessing is done. Uh, and as Dr. Kumar said, you need to adhere to all manufacturer's instructions for use, and there has to be fastidious manual cleaning of the, of the instruments before placing in your HLD machine. It's also recommended that we use an automatic endoscope or processor machine, that this does a better job than manual HLD. So if you're not using an AER, that's probably the first thing you might wanna buy. You also need to have adequate, tra adequately trained staff. So you need a training program and you need a program for continuing education so that they maintain those skills. And I think it's also prudent to have quality measurement and improvement processes to identify when, th when, when we're starting to have breakdowns in the process that can be quickly fixed. Now, is HLD inadequate? Well, for duodenoscopes, maybe HLD is inadequate. We know about these multi-drug resistant organisms that have been transmitted, and, and especially concerning are the carbapenem resistant enterobacteraceae or CRE. Now, just to to review, these are, are natural bacteria, naturally occurring bacteria that acquire a plasmid encoding the resistance factors. And these are gram negative rods that are normal gut bacteria. Um, in the duodenal um, scope outbreaks with CRE, no reprocessing breaches were identified in most outbreaks. And some of the factors that have been identified were the uh, development of biofilms, presence of scope damage, and then human factors. These were first reported, these CRE outbreaks were first reported in 2014 with most series between 2015 and 2016. But I note that there are very few reports since then. And the question is why, where, are, where have these outbreaks gone? 
are they still happening, but we're not hearing about them, or are they really not as prevalent anymore? Well, we should all be concerned about CRE because treatments are limited or non-existent due to the degree of bacterial resistance to antibiotics, although they may respond to immunoglycosides. These, um, these resistant organisms are spreading widely because the plasmid is encoded and can be spread from bacteria to bacteria and also across species. Um, the spread of the bacteria themselves can be silent. So these Enterobacteraceae are normal gut flora, and all of us may, may harbor, harbor resistant gram-negative rods and be completely unaware of it. Once an infection happens, there's a high mortality rate, mortality rate due to lack of treatment. However, these bacteria are not inherently more pathogenic than the ones without the resistant plasmids. So let's just talk a bit about sterilization, especially with ethylene oxide. And the pros on this is it's really the gold standard for devices that cannot be um, heat sterilized in an autoclave. There are a number of cons. First is, is scope damage. These scopes here on the upper right here are um, scopes that um, are our scopes that we had sent for ethylene oxide. And you have to either take the cap off of it or there's a little vent you have to open. That wasn't done and the scopes literally blew up. Um, it, even when they don't blow up, repeated uh, exposure to ethylene gas may shorten the use life of an expensive duodenoscope. Ethylene oxide is flammable. Ethylene oxide is toxic, so it has to be handled uh, carefully and with proper ventilation. Um, because it's toxic, you have to have a long aeration step of 18 to 24 hours to make sure that all the ethylene oxide is gone before you take it out of the processor. For these reasons, it's not generally available. You do require special facilities, and all this makes it expensive. And there's also a concern that a contaminated scope may not get sterilized especially if the contamination is in an area of damage of the scope. Um, now, Dr. Cornell touched on liquid chemical sterilization with the Steris machine. Uh, the pros is that this particular machine uses heated parasitic acid, and it's approved for sterilization based on lab testing and an FDA cleared for sterilization. Um, it is available pretty much every, everywhere in the world. Uh, some, some things we don't know, it's really unclear if it's clinically effective in preventing these CRE outbreaks. So once a scope becomes contaminated, if you put it in steris, does it does that actually clean the contamination or not? Now, when, when people have looked at the ability of this machine to sterilize scope, it results in about the same six log reductions in bacterial load as typical HLD. So is it really sterile, especially when you have to uh, clean it with... Um, with water, which with water that's semi-sterile and hang it in a, in a closet where it isn't sterile. Maybe it isn't sterile. There is some concern about long-term damage to endoscopes. And if you have to switch your current systems to this system, there is some cost involved. Future sterilization techniques include the, this Langford system that uses a washing machine with high flow water and detergent. It would be an adjunct to HLD and it's not yet available. And hydrogen peroxide plasmas, there are devices like this one shown uh, that are available for small non-complex devices, but there are no current peroxide plasma uh, devices for endoscopes. Well, there are some other approaches with our duodenoscopes other than, than going to sterilization. Um, Dr. Kumar already talked to you about these disposable tips and all three manufacturers now make them. It improves access uh, to and cleaning of the elevator assembly, comes with a special uh, brush. Um, is it really clinical and effective at reducing infections and CRE transmission? Don't really know, um, but um, if you don't, uh, all, all the new scopes that you buy have this feature now. How about single use scopes? Um, there's two companies that make them, uh, Boston and Ambu. There are some issues with the functionality of these scopes. You, they're, they're okay. I've used them. They're, they're not as good as your single use scope. Um, they're costly um, in the two to $3,000 range to buy a scope. You also need to get the light source image processor. There's the issue of the medical waste, although these companies have come up with innovative ways to um, uh, try to uh, reuse several of the parts. Um, 
And then the supply chain issue. If you're doing a thousand DRCPs a year, where do you keep a thousand duodenoscopes? And if you have to have them um, delivered in what's called just in time, will they get there in time? I don't know. So some other approaches include culturing the scope and a culture in quarantine uh, method. Um, and then you, if you have a positive scope, then you sterilize only the positive scopes. This is quite work intensive. These culture protocols are rigorous and difficult. And if you don't do it right, you can get a lot of false positives and false negatives. When these scopes are in quarantine and they can be in quarantine for up to 48 hours, you, your scopes can't be used. And so you will need extra scopes, which, which is a cost. You could, on the other hand, culture the patient. For example, you could do rapid PCR of a rectal swab which in fact can be done right in your unit um, with a little device takes about an hour. And then if the patient is CRE positive, you, after the procedure, you ethylene oxide sterilize that through a denoscope. And then a lot of places went to double HLD, which is just doing HLD twice. It's of unclear benefit, um, but at least in one study uh, showed that elevator contamination may persist. So here are my recommendations. For standard endoscopes, do well-performed HLD. Use a well-maintained automatic endoscope or processing machine. And make sure that the germicide that you're using is being tested as recommended. You need to follow the, manu structure, the manufacturer's instructions for use the IFUs. And it's really important to have adequate training of personnel. And not only that you train them well, but you have a program to maintain their competency. I think having a quality program is, is very advisable, and it should particularly be focused on those pre-HLD steps, um, especially the manual cleaning. Um, this could include um, ATP or other bio-burden testing. Uh, basically, you do the manual steps, test the scope. If you don't have any more ATP, then you put it in the HLD machine. Um, probably periodic observation of personnel and making sure they know what they're doing and maybe even periodically culturing um, your duodenoscopes uh, to survey them to see if they've become infected. For duodenoscopes, I think we have options. Um, we, you, should you could perform well-performed HLDs we've talked about, also have a scope maintenance program to prevent um, uh, damage from occurring in the scope that you're not aware of. I, I wanna note that there are no, that no manufacturer that makes duodenoscope recommend sterilization. Um, and they have to submit the cleaning data to the FDA to get their scope um, approved. So it's clear that you should be able to high level disinfect to adenoscopes. I think also when you're buying new scopes, you should move to scopes with caps, uh, maybe retire your, your earlier scopes a little early to get the scopes with the caps. Alternatives include ethylene oxide sterilization, which is what we do at Mayo Clinic a liquid sterilization, such as the Steris machine. Where should single use scopes be used? I think low volume centers where it's hard to maintain those skills because uh, reprocessing the duodenoscope is harder and it's easier to make mistakes. So maybe in a low volume center, they make, they, they make sense. Maybe using these scopes on patients who already have CRE to prevent it, you know, your regular scopes from getting contaminated uh, or maybe immunocompromised patients. And then also consider culture strategies. When regarding to endoscopic ultrasound scopes, you know, you should note that some have elevators like this curvilinear array scope has. However, there have only been rare reports of bacterial con contamination. These scopes are not compatible with ethylene oxide uh, due to the electronics, but however, they are compatible with Steris. Um, and I feel that well-performed HLD is adequate. So in terms of choosing widely, I think that well-performed high-level disinfection is adequate for the vast majority of scopes and clinical settings. Do adenoscopes require additional considerations? And a well-performed pre-cleaning is a must for both HLD and sterilization to be successful. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Feigel, for your concise overview of the current choices in the endoscope reprocessing field. Now, uh, besides our speaker, I will welcome our panelists.
Professor Singh, Professor Imran, and Professor Chadari to join us for uh, the panel discussion. Everyone. So there is one question for uh, Professor Kumar. How often do you train your disinfection team? For them? Well, uh, we do it once in six months and uh, we take the help of the industry people to come and uh, uh, spend a few hours with us and they do we do both classroom training and then followed by the actually disinfection room uh, training and uh, do them actually make them actually do it and i realized with time that our staff is enjoying it and they uh, and that's make them more conscious to keep up to up to grade that yes sir. And for the other uh, centers, Professor Singh, how do you train your staff? Yeah, so um, I uh, want to just compliment, first of all, all the speakers for a wonderful talk and training program, uh, which Dr. Uh, Kumar has mentioned. It's six monthly and uh, definitely for the new staff joining in, there's a little more extensive training. And uh, after that, the competencies are done every uh, yearly on annual basis. And there is also a perceptor program that we generally recommend for uh, institutes uh, which have a high volume in which the perceptors are, you know, aligned with the best practices on training and they learn from each other on the Thank you. Any other input from the other panelists on this important factor in the Infection. And maybe um, ask some of the other panelists also to comment. I think the um, the point has been well made about the manual, you know, the manual cleaning being a critical step and the staff training. Um, maybe you know one of the um, objectives of this kind of a, a platform is to sort of share practices and see what has been the challenges. Um, also to talk about challenges in staff training. So um, just some perspectives from around, if you can talk about what are the challenges maybe you've had with staff training, um, that would be helpful. Uh, if I may be allowed, uh, I would like to start on this. Uh, one of the major challenges that we have seen over the period of time uh, is that uh, COVID had really played a role in that uh, unavailability of, you know, the real level of uh, contact training programs have been uh, reduced uh, since last one and a half years. So the people, because they were traveling from outside the device manufacturers, so that was one of the challenges we faced. So we uh, uh, did make sure that uh, the online training, though it's not 100%, because this is something which is really a physical program to let them see. And the trainer also was comfortable in ensuring that the trainees are uh, getting the required skills. So that was one of the, the challenges I think uh, all of us faced during this pandemic uh, period. Uh, but apart from them, uh, their human resources overall uh, is I think, which is common in most of the Institute. Like, uh, do we have enough uh, manpower and equipment uh, to match the volume of cases that we have seen? So uh, in the different institutes, what we have uh, uh, visited and uh, done a program uh, to understand their you know, competence level. We found that uh, some of the institutes do compromise uh, on the quality of uh, reprocessing because they're high volume are there. So not enough time is, uh, you know, uh, given uh, between the procedures and the number of uh, endoscopes also uh, should definitely be accordingly matched. But uh, some of the institutes were not able to match. But now it's gaining importance as we uh, move on. And uh, now I think people are going towards that direction and making sure that in providing the best quality care services. Thank you. Uh, uh, may, I add, may I add to that? Uh, you see, uh, the challenges in uh, disinfection uh, uh, program is, I think what Dr. Singh has already just mentioned, is if your workload is high and you're due, not have that adequate number of scopes, and your turnover time increases, and that creates a problem. And that's the reason I did mention in one of the recommendations that endoscopic suites, while planning hospitals, were planning, they, 
they have to be given the uh, i think we have to set up the new guidelines that if you have this much number of scopes i mean the calculations have been done uh, uh, at least in india uh, it, these have been done at uh, by one factor but i will say that uh, which are very actually which are very basic and uh, genuine calculations that you, if you have to um, say if you say if you have to do x number of these procedures in this many hours say from 9 am to say 5 pm or whatever the time is that you have then you have to have minimum this infrastructure in that infrastructure should include the endoscopic suites the instruments uh, the number of equipment i think that will go a long way in uh, taking care of a lot of things because if you do not have that even the technical staff is under pressure somebody will shout the doctor will shout that yes please get it fast my patient is getting delayed and you know there are so many things which happen and somewhere or the other the laxity comes in or some shortcuts are creeping and that part has to be focused on uh, to do that and once it is made binding the all the hospitals now will be actually ultimately follow that and that's my uh, sincere uh, serious uh, suggestion on that and that becomes a big bottleneck and uh, so uh, i wanted to ask from the dog you said that you have been following the uh, gas uh, your uh, etio so do you find any damage to the scope what is your personal experience and we do uh, worry about that and you were your first time that none of the scopes has been actually being marketed as a sterilizable scope so how do you handle that Yeah, thank, thank, thanks, Ajay. So we're only sterilizing our duodenoscopes. All of our other instruments go through high-level disinfection. Um, they, the duodenoscope is goes through high-level disinfection first, and then then it goes down to our ethylene oxide facility, where it's exposed to ethylene oxide. Now, the first time we we sent scopes for ethylene oxide, we sent them to another facility, and they didn't do it correctly, and they blew up three scopes. Now, over time, though, we're not, we really haven't noticed that they're, you know, um, breaking down more or having more problems just from the exposure to, to ethylene oxide. So we've been continuing to be successful in doing it. Now, the extra turnover time, because essentially you can only use one duodenoscope, you can use it once for the day because the turnover time is, is about 17 hours. So you can't, you can't, um, plan on using it again that day so you got to make sure you have enough duodenoscopes you know in your suite that you can handle all the uses of it during that day now it's true that none of the scopes are you know manufacturers recommend or, or you know endorse a sterilization the fda does and says that that's fine also on the cap there's a little there's a little valve on the cap for the scopes that's actually a, a valve that's for doing ethylene oxide cancer sterilization. <laughs> so they make it so you can do it, or you can just take the cap off. Um, but, you know, it, it was a lot of effort um, to, to create this gas sterilization facility. Um, and then, you know, there are issues, the staff, you know, the new, the new ethylene oxide machines have like a little cartridge, which have the ethylene oxide in it. And it's made it a lot safer and more convenient uh, for the staff because ethylene oxide is toxic. It's a carcinogen. It's also highly flammable. So, you know, it's gotta be done correctly um, and handled properly. Thank you, Professor Pagan. There is another question from our audience. It's for uh, Dr. Coronel. Uh, the question is regarding the high level disinfection, uh, regarding if it's sufficient for colonoscope. And if you, Dr. Coronel, do you feel the same for procedures where a biopsy is involved, passing the blood mucose membrane? So good question. I think that as Dr. Fagel mentioned, I think that for most of our standard scopes, upper scopes, colonoscopes, radial EUS scopes, even the linear echo endoscope, I think that HLD is sufficient. I have heard of some people using stairs for the linear echo endoscope as well to take that additional step. But I think that for our standard scopes, um, well done HLD is, is good enough. Um, that being said, we have to put a lot of emphasis on the manual cleaning and we have to perform manual cleaning well, just to talk about training of our staff. We train our staff twice a year and, uh, we've created a leadership group with endoscopists, nurses, 
endoscopy technicians and infection control specialists. And we meet at least twice a year. Um, and there's surprise audits in the endoscopy unit to make sure that the manual cleaning is done well. And uh, Dr. Raju here uh, in Houston created an endoscopy tech training program that is uh, affiliated with a community college. So this is essentially a new degree program where endoscopy technicians can actually get a degree um, and uh, become educated in all of the different aspects in, of endoscopy. We also have a separate group of technicians that deal mainly with uh, scope uh, reprocessing. So these are reprocessing champions, as to say, they spend most of their time in the reprocessing unit. And these are the people that, that really know what they're doing. And um, whenever there's other technicians that have to clean the scopes, they are overseeing the process. So we're trying to put in multiple stop gaps to our process to make sure the manual cleaning aspect is done right. Um, before the, the new scopes, uh, we used to do uh, double HLD, but uh, to mention that double HLD is not doing manual cleaning, putting it on the a a AER, and then just running the machine in the a AER again. You actually have to take the scope out, do manual cleaning again, and then put it on the a AER. That's true double HLD. So before the new scopes, we used to do double HLD, and we used to culture our scopes. But now that we have the new scopes with a cap, we've actually opted to do a hybrid approach. So we have the new scopes that have the detachable cap, and we also have a disposable duodenoscope. So we have the availability to use both. And for our standard cases, we use the, the regular duodenoscope. As Doug was mentioning, um, the, the disposable duodenoscope, it's, it's not the friendliest to handle. Um, but when we have patients that are high risk um, or patients that are immunosuppressed, we are uh, using the disposable scope. So we have a hybrid approach that, that we're taking now. I'll just put a plug in for, I think this is a perfect time to put a plug in. I think um, in this webinar series, our next, re our next webinar will really focus on technology and duodenoscopes and disposable duodenoscopes. We'll explore that in great detail. So I thought it was the perfect time to put the plug in for that. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panala. Uh, passing from the high level disinfection and uh, endoscopes, there is another question for, um, from our audience for uh, Professor Pagel. A question is regarding the biopsy for CHEPS uh, as requ requiring sterilization, but some scopes not require sterilization, only HLD. So um, the question is if a procedure requires a biopsy, it is acceptable to be passing the sterile device down the sterile biopsy channel. Yeah, it's, it's fine to, to um, you know, you don't have to sterilize your scope just because you're putting a biopsy forcep or, or a snare through it. Um, high level disinfection is still, um, still adequate. But I'm going to ask a question to Dr. Cornell that's related to it, which is that um, our, our scopes are semi-critical, right? They, they touch mucous membranes until we go and do third space endoscopy like doing ESD or POEM or STIR or something like that. Should we be sterilizing the endoscopes that are used for those advanced procedures? I think that's a fantastic question. So we haven't been doing that. And I don't think, um, I would love to hear from other people that are doing third space endoscopy and ESD uh, and to see if there's any data with uh, sterilizing scopes for those specialized procedures. Uh, we haven't done notes yet, um, but we, we are doing ESD, STIR, uh, full thickness resection, and we're not sterilizing our scopes for that yet. We haven't seen any adverse events. There is also uh, the fact that, you know, once you put that scope down into the stomach, is it really sterile, stomach or colon or whatnot? Is it really sterile anymore? So in my opinion, I think that we probably are okay with good HLD and manual cleaning, even for advanced third space endoscopy or resection procedures. 
Um, but I'm interesting to, in, interested to hear from, from your center and other people if they are uh, using a special group of sterilized scopes for those kind of procedures. Yeah, we're not. We're using um, standard HLD on those scopes. And I think it's exactly what you said is that we're going through the mouth and the stomach. You know, it's not a sterile procedure. For the infection pro control programs and for surveillance sampling programs, how often do you uh, uh, use these programs in your units? Well, in terms of like um, infection surveillance, we we really haven't been, and I think that could that we could be criticized for it. For the duodenoscopes, we sterilize them, and we we do um, see whether you know we follow clinical data to see whether we're transmitting infections. We found no signals, so we haven't been um, culturing the scopes. We do use ATP though, ATP testing um, during the manual cleaning phase. Um, as a marker that maybe we got, you know, we've done a good job of reducing bio burden, um, but we're, we're not um, culture scopes regularly. I do have a follow-up question and maybe to the panelists and to Dr. Kumar. Are there guidelines in, let's say, India or other countries um, to address some of these issues, like how the multi-society guidelines were put out here What's the landscape of guidelines outside of the US? Uh, I'm uh, glad that Rahul you asked this question. Well, we have no specific country specific guidelines. What we tend to follow is the multi society guidelines uh, from the rest of the world. But only uh, two days back, the, actually, we have been able to bring it onto the national agenda. Uh, in, uh, society of GI Endoscopy of India has decided only two days back to come up with a uh, white paper on these issues in the next, uh, to the, uh, through a working group. And uh, this has been decided only two days back. I'm sure within this year, we'll have a, a proper, and that work, that white paper basically means we'll come out with the guidelines uh, and to reiterate in the Indian perspective. I was a member of the committee which set up the guidelines or the instructions for the developing countries as a part of WEO. Uh, which we presented in Hyderabad uh, meeting and it was later on published. But that's uh, the broader uh, thing that we follow. You see, when we look at the guidelines from, the, uh, from our country point of view, we also have to look into that as a number of centers, which are single endoscope, single endoscopist centers, and which, uh, what do we do for them? And they are still using the traditional Cydex sterilization, which is a uh, accepted thing in the WO uh, guidelines. And so uh, we uh, here we tend to cover each and every aspect and every setup because only that's the guidelines will be practical and uh, applicable, which applies to everybody, which gives a right path to everybody. And of course, uh, interestingly, we did one sample uh, trial, uh, five endoscopes during COVID, when we scoped the COVID patients uh, for a GI bleeding, and then we cultured uh, for the COVID after manual sterilization that traditionally that we used to follow. We did that only for the purpose of this uh, pilot study not for the purpose of uh, regular workup because the, we use AERs. And we all found that even after that, all those five uh, scopes were sterile uh, and we could not isolate COVID uh, out of them. It's just a, uh, information sharing. We have not published anywhere because nobody wants to publish the manual cleaning <laughs> protocol. <laughs> It's important to note that most viruses and COVID particularly are very easy to kill. And so just our regular disinfectants, you know, the, the manual cleaning step, just that step will, will get rid of COVID. Um, you know, the problem, of course, are these, these, these bacteria. And, and the other, just one other organism I touched on just very briefly are, are the prion related diseases like, you know, Yachtfeld, uh, Kreutzfeld disease. And nobody knows how to clean a scope that's, that has been exposed to that. And so there's, if you have a patient who for some reason needs endoscopy, 
you know, you're, you're probably that scope's just become disposable. Probably, um, you probably it's probably not safe to clean it and use it in another patient. So this is a question for 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 the panel and and see what people think about this. So there is a uh, one of the companies that makes the duod, the disposable duodenoscope Zambo is working on on disposable upper scopes and disposable colonoscopes. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Do you think that is going to, to be? It's a free world. <laughs> um, if, uh, I can just start with this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, so we had uh, run a sample, we got some samples for testing for uh, disposable uh, scopes, uh, but we uh, have not found any significant, uh, you know, like issue because you know earlier when we found that if high level sterilization is going well, and we do not have any uh, outbreak of any infection, uh, we probably could not find any validation uh, taking into account that the price of endoscopies, uh, which is paid by the insurance companies, was not acceptable. So they immediately declined to pay the extra amount. So it's all the burden that we as an organization have to take. So uh, after doing the three or four uh, uh, scopy from different companies, we decided not to continue with it. As of now, till the time it becomes uh, as part of a regulation, which is very strong in UAE. But as of uh, a date, uh, which I want to share, uh, the other part, like we uh, have discussed about the use of uh, uh, manual techniques and disinfection. Uh, one more aspect we found, uh, I'm just diverting from the topic, uh, is that occupational health needs uh, is very important uh, in UA and uh, especially like, you know, the staff who is uh, going to manually wash the endoscopes, uh, their hepatitis B vaccination, uh, their uh, insurance that they are not exposed to any enteric uh, pathogens and also the prophylaxis uh, uh, for them and uh, use of PPE was very, very important aspect that we felt should be dealt in a proper manner. So this was part of the training. Uh, but again, because of the low incidence of infection, the use of uh, uh, disposable uh, scopes was not very really, uh, positive uh, uptake from our organizations. Thank you. Uh, what about drying of the endoscope? As do you dry completely an endoscope before uh, using in your uh, workup? Uh, yes. Yeah, we, are, we are using the uh, started using the, uh, the last uh, three years started using the manufacturer supplied uh, the closets with the ultraviolet light which helps in drying and we find it's uh, good for two things it gives us a more surety that the drying is good number two uh, it uh, saves the space uh, you can put the uh, large number of scopes in a short, smaller space and so the storage space requirement has gone down. So we have started using that uh, and we are pretty happy with that. Just to give you an idea, uh, from the uh, 14 hospitals that we have at NMC, uh, 12 are using the drying cabinets. And it makes definitely a good sense, that investment. And uh, it's all manufacturer recommendations that we are following and uh, definitely. Uh, and we, it's like, you know, the uh, main uh, benefit what we got from the drying cabinet was the design of the cabinet itself. Like it has two big uh, opening. One side is the, from the, you know, cleaning part and the second door opens to the endoscopy room. So the structural design uh, requirements to get the endoscope after processing from one area to the next door was minimized. So that was the extra advantage that we got uh, from the storage cabinets for drying. Thank you. Uh, so another important uh, step is the endoscope um, storage time. So um, how long will you uh, wait until you reprocess again, the endoscope and use it. I, I think, uh, Rahul, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we're doing two, we can leave it for up to two weeks. Yes. In the, yeah, in the so. we're, we use Gab and it's like uh, uh, Dr. Kumar does. Yeah, at our center, it's two weeks. Um, and once that two weeks uh, is done, then it's sent again, especially for the dinoscopes. We're very particular about that. 
Same with us, it's 14 days. Okay, thank, thank you. And also an important aspect during, uh, especially colonoscopy or small bowel um, endoscopy, it's symmetric on use in order to facilitate uh, the viewing. So uh, what do you think? Because uh, it's known, of course, that simoticon, it's, um, it's a challenging part of the uh, uh, endoscope disinfection. So what, how do you, if you use it, how will you use it differently in order to not um, affect the disinfection process or what do you use, it, use instead? So in, in our case, um, the use of simeticon through the, through the water jet it's, uh, it's not recommended. So we don't put Symethicone on the water jet. Uh, if needed, um, we dilute it in water and then through the biopsy channel, which is a little bit larger, but we, we don't use it. We don't put it in the water bottle or put it on the water jet. You, you, we're, we're, we're the, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So it's through the uh, working channel, it's better. Thank you. Any other comment from the panelists? So uh, there's I have a, a question. Oh, sorry about that. There, there is a question in Spanish. Um, yes. So they're asking about what is the main limitation, uh, that one of the main limitations they have in Argentina is cost. And a lot of these technologies can be very difficult to, to adopt. So what would be the recommendation on a setting where cost is a limitation? Dr. Kumar, do you want to yeah, take? Yeah, probably Dr. Kumar. From um, the, you know, I'll, I'll just preface by saying that our first um, webinar we did, we really focused on the guidelines that Dr. Kumar was part of and wrote uh, on uh, for developing countries, but also for other resource uh, constrained sort of environments. And so I'll defer to him, but we kind of went over uh, a few of these. I think those guidelines, that guideline paper is really, really valuable and, and kind of goes over many of the strategies, but I'll let Ajay talk. No, I, I understand the question, the, the cost involved. Uh, is that the question that the cost uh, involved in adopting the new technologies and the new uh, uh, methods of sterilization or the, I mean, uh, uh, for the developing countries, cost becomes a major, major issue. In India, majority are paying from their pocket. Insurance coverage has increased from the previous ones, but still it is not covering more than two to 3% of population. And state pays for the poor patients in the teaching institutions, academic institutions. And at the same time, you know, a lot of academic institutions are outside the state thing and patients have to pay from their pocket. And it is exorbitant to even look at all those things. Even today's uh, technology, it becomes a heavy burden. So whenever we have to look at the new technologies, we always have to wait from the, how much population can be benefit, be benefit. Cost, it's not easy to cal calculation. People can go on to a, uh, uh, saying that even one life saved is uh, worth it, whatever the money is, it's easy said than done because uh, you have to adapt, uh, apply it to the, across the board to the different populations. And from that angle, cost is the major thing. So we always are, uh, striving hard to create the right balance between the safety and the effectiveness. That's right. Yes, I definitely agree with uh, Dr. Rajay. This is a very big problem. Um, uh, it's a very big problem, especially in Pakistan as well. It's the same as in India. So it's a big problem that we, when we are talking about technologies, it's, we have to look at the cost as well. And cost is a big issue in a developing countries. So I see, So to put in the light of end, these are the, one of the few things where India and Pakistan agree. <laughs> yes, other than cricket. <laughs> I, I, I also I would like to ask uh, the panelists from Western uh, countries, because I think not only the cost is the problem here, what about the 
carbon footprint, I mean, uh, using all these single use de devices or disposable uh, devices uh, for, gen for sure will increase this, uh, this burden. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think so. I mean, we've we've talked about it a lot. the The two companies that make the single use duodenoscope, you know, have some clever reprocessing and, and recycling systems that they use, and, and many of the components, in fact, are reused from within the scope, like some of the electronics. But you know, it's a lot more waste, and also probably a lot more carbon, as all these components now have to be shipped around and brought to your hospital. And you have to have a place to put them all. Uh, you know, I do think that there's some significant environmental concerns um, about a system that uses a very complicated um, instrument just once and throws it away. It sounds like an American thing, you know, to do that. <laughs> it's interesting, though, that this is probably the first time that the medical or at least the GI endoscopy community has really focused on the sustainability, um, you know, issue. And I think that this is probably the first time that as new technology is being developed, there's a lot more uh, attention to that rightfully so. So I think um, that question is being asked of the manufacturers and should be asked to, as they sort of iterate their technologies. Now, yesterday only I came across a posting post from Jindhar uh, uh, from UK, where they talk, started the concept of looking at a green endoscopy. I don't know what they're talking about, the same issues, but that uh, they started propagating about the green endoscopy. You know, this interesting concept when you talk about green world. You need a windmill to uh, generate the electricity to turn the lights on in your scope, then it's green. <laughs> Uh, there is an also interesting question in Spanish. As I answer after it, I think it refers to including in guidelines this uh, uh, price um, limits also for the Eastern or uh, um, developing countries. What, what what's your opinion on this? How should we uh, let's say um, stay in range with the security? The protocols and also the cost uh, effectiveness of uh, single use devices and disposable devices. Uh, Ophelia, your uh, mic is a bit slow. I cannot hear you properly. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, it, the question was referring to the guidelines and including in the guidelines the security protocols, also the cost problems for developing countries and how should we develop a balance between these two items? I think there should be a need, there's a need to introduce that. It's been, maybe those guidelines need upgrading or some addendum or something. Uh, 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 one can always look into that as a fresh outlook with the newer information, newer technology, and newer thoughts on that. A lot of things have happened since those guidelines came up, uh, especially in the area of duodenoscope infections. I think it's uh, better to incorporate the whole information into those uh, and use that to framing the new guidelines. One can needs a look into that. Yeah, I mean, you know, putting costs into safety guidelines is always somewhat problematic, right? Because you don't want to be sacrificing safety to save money, right? You don't want to have a day where you have so many patients that you can't clean your endoscopes properly. So, um, you know, we have to be cost sensitive when we make these guidelines. But on the other hand, we also have to set a floor and say, you know, below this, we're just not willing to go. And you, you got to clean your scopes properly between procedures and you can't take you can't take uh, shortcuts um, I think one of the big questions for the developing world is whether they sh whether everyone should be using uh, the the reprocessing machines the reprocessing machines have been shown to do a better job than manual um, HLD you know just with the pumps and the side X and stuff um, and but you know they are costly both to get and to maintain and to buy the germicides that go in them that there is a cost to that 
Um, I think that's a that's a harder question to answer. Um, you know, with duodenoscopes are certain parts of the world that are that have very high prevalence of CRE, and so if you're in a prevalence, uh, if you have an area where you're practicing, you know, you have a lot of resistant organisms in your institution or in your town or city. You know, you really need to double down on what you're doing to clean your scopes and especially the duodenoscope. So that has to be taken into account as well. Yeah. If there is there are any questions or comments regarding this, or maybe as a wrap-up uh, comment to refer to the quality program implementation and uh, uh, not only in the units and also over the countries. So uh, how um, deep do you think the national and international uh, endoscopy society should be involved? in the, assessing these uh, standards? Uh, yeah, I think uh, national societies have a big, big role to play in that. I have been talking to my current office peers to, that there should be a constant training programs, not only by the individual this thing, but the and uh, training as well as assessment programs from the society representatives to the across the country. And so working on that, maybe something will come out and I'm sure that something will come out of that. And uh, uh, this is the best way to uh, do that. And uh, to quality checking constantly, which can be done only at the national level. It cannot be done at the international level. And uh, every country has its own compulsions, has its own uh, realities on the ground, practical, uh, we understand that, and that has to be done. So even if we can implement what is today accepted, I think that is the most important thing. Rather than to going in the next level, if you can do that, your 99% job is done with the current thing. Yes, there will be certain issues, special high uh, immunosuppressed, highly comprom immune compromised uh, patients, high risk patients of CRE, that particular thing should be reserved for a few selected centers rather than spreading across the country. That's my thought process, but I'm sure the society will discuss those issues and come to a good balance on that. And I personally feel what you said is that it should be at the society level, uh, uh, which it has to take care. Yeah, I think the question is, what's really the role of the professional societies, the medical societies in quality assurance? And in the United States, what's happened here is that the societies are the ones that kind of create the standards. You should have a quality improvement program. Here are some of the things maybe should be in a quality improvement program, but we don't police it. It's not the societies that go into the institution and say, oh, are you doing it? Instead, it's the accrediting organizations like the Joint Commission is one that's used in the United States and a lot of parts of the world. Um, but I do think the societies have a vital role to play. If the societies are not, you know, endorsing quality improvement and reprocessing, then, then no one's going to do it. So the societies do have a role to play in setting the standards um, so that we, we we're doing a better job with um, reprocessing our scopes and, and perfect, preventing patient infections. very much to all the speakers and panelists and uh, thank you dr panala for coordinating this uh, this uh, session and inviting uh, me so i will uh, give the microphone to you so over to you thanks a lot yeah no i wanted to sort of first thank you very much for um moderating the discussion and the speakers for you know a fabulous discussion and for this uh, uh, very important topic. I just want to put in a pitch also for the WEO core program, which is the um, you know collaboration of organized um, endoscopy units. This is a, a, an initiative to promote quality while being cognizant of the different challenges that we all face in different regions of the world. So I hope that if you're not a member of it, uh, your endoscopy unit will consider that. So um, thanks also to Alexandra for um, the setting things up and, and made, you know letting this run smoothly. So I really appreciate everyone's time and input. Thank you.